how are you? Oh, look, you're, wearing, you're flying the flag, as it were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Time to wake up. How are you doing? Good, good. Everything's going fine under the crazy circumstances. This is the first time we've spoken, yeah. other than our little communications. And I, I, I didn't really know, know you at all. In fact, I still don't really know you at all. So, so who is Chris Armstrong in, in 30 seconds or less? Well, uh, let's see. I, I, I got into uh, computer science and artificial intelligence things way back in the late 70s, I started. But I was also I'm mostly a musician my whole life. But then because of some issues with injuries and surgeries and things, I had to not only be able to teach for a while. But anyway, since I was already into computers, I went more deeply into computers as to have a profession, something to do while my arm wasn't working. And so uh, that I've sort of had this dual career. But as far as transhumanism related things, I I write a few articles uh, that are online, but several years I've been working on a, a book, which is a sort of a, an analysis or guidebook of Zoltan Ishvan's uh, uh, The Transhumanist Wager. To sum it up, you're, you're a computer scientist, an artist, a writer, you're a Renaissance man. Ah, uh, yes, yes, that's, yeah, I, I, I should have said that. Yeah. What were your initial reactions to the film when you first saw it? I'm a perfect candidate for it because I already knew uh, a lot about uh, FM and uh, I was interested in it and I was fascinated right away with the film because I go, oh, I thought it was just going to be a regular documentary uh, of of him. And then it was like this kind of drama mentry or something, docudrama or something and with uh, that sort of blurred the lines of like, uh, is is this when when is the real part? You know, I couldn't always tell, but since I knew kind of a lot about FM already, I I sort of could figure out what was dramatizations and what was you know just literal documentary type stuff. So I loved it, of course. I mean, he's one of my favorite characters in this, you know, in transhumanism and early transhumanism. He was a he, he seems to me to be a to have been ahead of many people really looking forward and seeing things that I didn't hear other people talking about. You know, because he had these different threads, universalism, abundance, you know, yes. um, uh, I'm missing one, and immortality, universalism, abundance, Optim well, optimism, universalism, abundance. Yeah. Yes. So I mean, like, you know, you hear, you know, Peter Diamandis, for example, talking a lot about abundance, and you hear him talking about immortality, these other threads, don't really, I mean, you hear different people talking about different things. His skill was to sort of think about it holistically. You say you're a perfect candidate, which is interesting because, you know, there are, there are a lot of people who kind of walked into it and, you know, were thrown by, you know, it doesn't fit a particular box. All of us, to some degree, like to put things in boxes. And when they're not in the exact box, yeah. you know, it's hard for us to go with it. It may have, it may be because of my artistic side, my musician side, my composer side, where you you start off with a given, but you take it somewhere else. I mean, you don't just stay where you begin. And so I guess that's maybe how I look at it. Uh, there are lots of movies. I think it's also my personality. I can, there can be movies that I may not even like a whole like half hour of it. But at the the totality of it, I can I can end up saying I love it. I love that movie, even though there was a whole chunk I didn't care for at all. I'm into Bruce Lee and his philosophies, and his one of his ideas was, uh, you know, to extract what is useful from something, take what is useful, reject what is not useful, and make it your own. So. I always sort of look at everything that way. I say, well, okay, I don't agree with 60% of this thing, but there's this 30% this that I really like. So I like it or I, I find it useful. So I, I think that's it. But in your case, I mean, that, that wasn't the case. I, I liked everything about this movie. There was nothing, I, I didn't have to like exclude this yucky part and really love this other part. I was so taken aback. I was surprised and uh, I wasn't, and I like that, I guess. I think I like that in general in art and music. I like when things surprise me. I don't like to go, if I just hear the same thing, I go, okay, I know where it's going to go. Oh, it went there. 
okay, fine, I can still like it, but I get really excited when something, you know, confounds my expectations or the box I thought it was going to be in. I also wanted to think about, you know, how do you make some, you know, talk about this person, you know, it, who talked about these really otherworldly things in a way that's, that feels present, that, that, you know, that was the intent anyway. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me about what you knew of FM and then, you know, what new facts or, 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 or things that you thought about in terms of FM? Well, I had read a, a couple of years ago related to this, this book that I'm writing. There were some things that came up, some themes and ideas in, in Zoltan's book that reminded me of something I vaguely remembered of FM. And so I uh, sort of made a quest to go and get by used copies of all his books. And so I had all of them except the, the very last one. And when I revisited him after not reading him for a few years, I realized, oh yeah, he, he it's, it's still relevant. The thing I really appreciate about him or find interesting about him, Zoltan, is they're very adamant, definitive. It's almost like they're giving you a, um, a manifesto of how it is or how they see it will be in a very confident and certain way. Whereas when I talk about transhumanism, I tend to say, well, if this hypothesis turns out to be true, such and such will happen according to this idea, I sort of couch it that way where I'm not that supremely confident of how several things will turn out and they could go different ways and certain ideas may turn out to be, uh, it didn't work out the way we expected, etc. So I sort of, I'm interested by FM's like certitude. He'll just, he, he makes proclamations. He's got a whole societal structure in his head of how it will be, how it will be according to this, these ideas of uh, immortality and optimism and this and that. He, he has a fully formed uh, concept for society and the future world that he sees. You, you, you sort of went into sort of my next question, which is uh -huh. the things that you feel are, you know, in sync with FM's views on the future and what's different? It might be a difference of scope and focus rather than like I have a wholly di different idea of how it's going to work out in him. I think it's because when I think and write about transhumanism, I'm interested in certain little aspects more than others. And so it gives me, it inspires me to say, okay, maybe I should, you know, become a little more well-rounded and more well-versed in some of these other areas instead of just focusing on my, my little areas of interest, which is mostly from my AI time when I was spent like six years or something intensely studying like neural modeling, trying to use the way the brain works to inspire intelligent computer systems and things like that. Why do you think, you know, positive depictions of the future are so rare, whereas uh, in, in film or in art in general? What's your sort of hypothesis in terms of what, why that is? Yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a really annoying thing to me. Uh, <laughs> currently, there are all these interesting, interesting sci-fi futuristic related shows coming up, uh, devs, there's Altered Carbon, uh, The Expanse, all these are futuristic things. And they're all just dark as hell. They, they, even if they're like two or 300 years in the future, I look at their vision of it and they're saying, oh, we're still just as, you know, venal and, and selfish and, and fighting over resources and everything else. All we just have, we just have new fancier toys now. That's how a lot of it is. And I, I have a suspicion that it's just human nature. It's, there's more survival value to be, to be frightened of something you don't fully understand or something new than to just say, oh yeah, let's go for it. It's great. Uh, you know, I think it's just deeply embedded in human psychology to fear change. You know, if, if the current situation is good enough, is okay, 
why would we radically want to change it? Everything could go to hell, you know? So I, I think that's it. It's deeply annoying. There's a, there's a book I ordered recently because it was a whole, a whole compendium of amazingly positive views of the future. The main one I can think of that everyone knows that is, uh, stands out for its positivity is like Star Trek. Uh, you know, there's lots of conflict and bad guys, but it's basically the message is here we are several hundred years in the future and we made it. They mentioned sometimes there was a nuclear conflagration on Earth that caused a lot of trouble, but we made it. We kept going and we improved and we're beyond a lot of pettiness and all these things. So there's one positive view of the future, but it is in the minority as far as I can tell. Are there films or books or works, works of art that sort of inspired you to sort of think at least optimistically about the future? Well, the, the first and easy answer is FM's books, obviously, he's Mr. Optimism. It's not directly, directly related to transhumanism or futurism, but the first book that came to my mind, which was the big influence on me in a positive way when I was getting into artificial intelligence, it's actually, it's actually the, probably the book that got me into it, which is Douglas Hofstetter's book, Gödel Escher Bach, right? Where he's, he's, he's mixing mathematical and scientific ideas with artistic music uh, ideas and all this stuff and viewing things from the point of view of different levels. Everything is, there's levels to everything. And if you look at it on the wrong level, you're going to, you're going to have a sort of an impoverished understanding of it. And so that book was really positive in that way. Let's just bottom line it. I think as one of my friends used to say, you just have good chemicals because I'm just generally a positive pers person. And I, I look at for the positive part and I, I recognize there's negative parts, but for example, I'm not, I don't think I'm a good person to be on a committee to worry about the, the dangers of some new technology because I'm too far to the other extreme. I think my amygdala is shrunken or atrophied, which is the part <laughs> of your brain that is, deals with fear and aggression and those kind of things, as opposed to some other people, their amygdala is firing all the time, everything. But yeah, so to my standard of optimism, I can hardly think of any, anything that inspired me. I think I, my inspiration comes from within my good brain chemicals and focusing on the, the people who do have some positive things to say, which a lot of transhumanists do. Zoltan's book, even though there's a lot of conflict and some people really hate it and only look on the negative of that book, but that's at least the ending of it is it had a, a positive ending, you know, which isn't uh, easy to find. What sort of depictions of the future or, or, or thematically do you think are being ignored in, 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 in stories? I'm not just talking about positive or negative. I mean, I, I mean, is it, well, I'll leave it to you. Maybe you have some, some thoughts on that. Well, one thing that has always for a long time stood out to me about, let's say Star Trek, which is one of my favorites, but I think something that it sort of has a lack of vision where you know, people we're talking about in the 24th century and beyond. Uh, and these are still biological people. Almost everyone's biological walking around, endangering their only copy of their software and their body in these uh, adventures. And a lot of people, when they think about the future, they still see us, just us, planted in the future as we are with uh, and including with all our, all our current problems of resource scarcity and all this stuff just taken with us into the future. And I think that's one of the ways that we get to these negative futures because we take all our problems and think, oh, now we can amplify all those problems with new technology. Because you, you touched on it, you know, your AI background and, and your art like they obviously inform your worldview or part of your worldview. Sure. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, well, okay, the AI side, the thing I'm most interested in now is 
neuroscience. I wish like 20 years ago, I would have gone into some more uh, er, uh, neuroscience course instead of going to finish my master, uh, bachelor's and master's in non-Western music, which I loved. But at that moment, I wish I would have gone there. And transhumanists tend to view the brain and consciousness as the whole ball of wax, not as a dualist thing where there's a spirit that when the brain dies, the spirit will go on and there are separate things. The fundamental hypothesis that I run on is that everything we are is in the brain. We know so little about it so far. We know even less about this crazy thing called consciousness that people still write books about. And since we know so little about it, it's premature to decide that, well, we know that consciousness is a separate thing from the brain. I think everything we are, our identity, our memories, our personality, our everything is contained in the brain. And once we can scan that, understand it to the degree we can put it into a, another kind of platform, right? Uh, that, that is non-biological and more sturdy and copyable, which has all a whole bunch of <laughs> issues, <laughs> potential issues, right? But um, that is my fundamental thing that I operate from as far as the AI thing, where I think someday we'll be able to put this, this our consciousness, everything we are, our consciousness pattern, right? Our full multi-dimensional consciousness pattern into another platform, right? Uh, so that's that informs everything I think about, about transhumanism and the future, because that's my focus. That's how I think we're gonna be able to transcend biology and have a, a shot at immortality, or at least an indefinite lifespan, a choice of how long we live. Um, so as far as the artistic side, how that informs me, yeah, if I weren't a musician and interested in these artistic things, I think I would be completely different. I mean, I don't even know what I would be like if you subtracted that out. So, so that is like one of the most influential things that I'm not even conscious of. It's just how I look at things from a compositional level and and I look at all kinds of things in musical terms all the time. You touched on this, you never even answered this, but I'll ask it to you specifically. Okay. Like, where do you land on the biological versus mind uploading side of the transhuman debate? I wrote a story, I wrote a story that's online in 2013 called, But Which One Is Me? And it's about copying, a person being copied to another body and all this. And, and I'm taking this side of, I think when that person wakes up in the new body with their brain completely scanned in all relevant detail, they will wake up and go, it worked. They will feel like they are them still. They have, they brought everything with them because I don't see that what we are is somewhere else besides right here. Um, of course, there's embodiment too. People talk about that. Like to have the full human experience, you need to have your body. Your body has lots of sensors and is taking in information too. But, but I think, you know, even a person who is completely paralyzed can still have an experience of the world. And, and, I, and if, it, if, it sh if there's some mysterious thing that we cannot be copied by some physical process, then that will foil uh, a fundamental part of transhumanism. I mean, transhumanism will not survive. It's just, it'll just be fancy medical interventions or something like that and ph philosophizing. If we cannot transcend biology, then... Does it have to, you know, end up being something, I don't know, non-organic to make it good? Only in one aspect. I, well, probably because of my my 10 surgeries and all these injuries and all these things that make certain parts of my body not work, I am very keenly aware of the fragility of biology, biology. And no matter how great we can extend our lives, maybe we can make us live 500 years, 
you can destroy this vessel that contains our consciousness and our software with nothing more technologically advanced than a, like a, a large rock and a pointed stick. Biological creatures that evolved on this planet are very fragile. They have to live in a very narrow temperature and et cetera range, right? And they have to have this food that's the, eating this food all the time and getting their energy that way in kind of a second hand. If we can make the human body the way it is, and but sturdy, not subject to radiation, temperature, just blunt force trauma, all this, then I would say, great, because it's already been figured out by evolution. A lot of it, you know, all the great sensory and, and higher brain functions we can do, that's there. But we can be, I can walk outside and get hit by a truck and that's it. And there's no backup of my consciousness anywhere. Uh, that's, you know, a simple blunt force accident can end us now. So that's the only reason. I guess, <laughs> that I insist on transcending biology. Well, let's talk about what's going on now. I mean, you're, we're all in this corona lockdown yeah. and talking about fear and talking about... Uh, well, wh what's your sense of how is society going to be affected by what's going on right now? All right, me being Mr. Optimism, first I'll start with one minor pessimistic thought, which infected my brain a, a week ago when I saw a tweet by somebody who was responding to people saying, this is going to change everything. From now on, we won't do blah, blah, blah. This person said, remember 1957, the Asian flu? That is in the past. We, don't, we didn't even think of it. We didn't prepare for another one like that very well, uh, even though in the last few years, we've had, well, Bill Gates did a TED Talk, I think, five years ago, saying, it's coming. It's not a question of if. It's going to be here. And there's many other people. And any person who understands biology knows it's coming. So I don't know. That's a negative thing. Like, oh, God, it's happened as recently as in the 50s. And he was saying, we didn't really reset our culture very much or at all. The, at least here, here's the positive side. This is something that we're, it seems like we're all sort of united in this. I think there's a generation now that's, that's getting hit with something that has disrupted our lives. I can't think of anything in my lifetime that has disrupted almost everyone's life at once to such a degree. People, no money, no, no jobs, no, no everything. You know, we don't go anywhere. You can't even go to a bookstore. You know, it's like, it's nuts. So we have this generation or several generations that are alive right now that are getting this impact, seeing this and living through it and seeing how the lack, possibly the lack of planning or foresight has made this worse. And we had to like, luckily we did somewhat late jump on and say, we have to kill this it may at least nudge us a few notches more uh, in the direction of uh, foresight and, and because humans are very good at putting things off that are not immediate things impinging on their survival at the moment. We can put it off and go, oh yeah, well, yeah, the environment might be messed up in 50 years, but I'll be dead and I have bills to pay. And you know, it's just human nature again. It's global. This isn't, oh, so-and-so in, this is my dad in London, my sister in Africa, you know, my friends in New York, my friends in, you know, in LA. This is, you know, and, and, and not just my friends, everybody, you know. So I do think it's going to, but my hope is that people will start taking these things seriously. We start, you know, Dean came and said to me when we, well, I'm sure it's not just to me, but, you know, has this line that we get what we celebrate as a culture. So when we celebrate war and we celebrate conflict, we invest billions, trillions of dollars in, in, in tanks and, and, and warfare and, and so on. And if we start respecting, like it's wonderful in New York, because I'm in New York part of the time, um, 
of late and every you know at seven o'clock every day everybody's like cheering out their windows and it's clapping and it's got this very kind of you know communal vibe and my hope is that that you know and in celebration of the healthcare workers uh-huh. and my hope is that 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 will be the focus that will be focused on that um there's a lot of political strands in transhumanism today mm-hmm. tell me a little bit about that and is that positive is that negative or is that just a factor of like you say human nature of the last five years or possibly more i sort of i've just come to see politics as a cesspool that uh, that i sort of ignore and put <laughs> but so and speaking since you said human nature I do have this bias or opinion that political viewpoints are possibly the result of brain structures. The way people have been brought up and the way their brain is, they filter things through these, they're naturally predisposed to filter things in certain ways, just based on their upbringing. Once they get to a certain stage, everything goes through that thing. I mean, I used to be more, I used to be a libertarian, right? I, uh, when I was younger, I would call myself a libertarian and all this. And I, everything I heard and thought of that was political or economic went through a filter that said, well, what is the, what is the libertarian view of that? I mean, I didn't think of this consciously, but as I look at it now, I go, yeah, you, you have certain premises that you've accepted and whatever input you comes in is filtered through those premises and on all that. So uh, I'm not, uh, actually transhumanism sort of took me out of libertarianism. I saw it as two, libertarianism, capitalism. I see them as older, you know, to me, capitalism is a great way of managing scarcity or it's a way a powerful way, whether it's great or not is debatable, but <laughs> it, 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 it thrives on scarcity. I mean, in, for free market people, they can't even decide on the value of something until they know how scarce it is. Scarcity determines how valuable it is. Scarcity and how many people want it. If it's scarce, but no one cares, that's fine. But scarcity really drives a lot of the old way of doing business. I call it the old way because I'm looking to a, to a future new way. I really appreciate your time. I really thank you. And, and we'll, we'll get this edited and we'll, we'll get this up. I mean, this has been fun. Me too. All right, you be well.